Hey folks, Quillyteen here, and welcome to another episode of our complete beginner's tutorial to European of Sals 4. We're still playing as Castile, and mostly what we're doing is we're waiting for our truce with Granada to wear off so that we can introduce warfare. We have built our military up to our maximum force limit. We're mostly watching the carnage going on in France as they get picked apart by a combined Austrian, English, a Portuguese um, alliance here. Very bad for France. Um, meanwhile, we just got a pop-up about Poland. So this is an event that happens at the beginning of the game between Poland and Lithuania. Um, basically, because of reasons related to kings dying, Poland has got the chance to decide to form a personal union with Lithuania, which is exactly what they did right here. So now, if we check Poland, they, have, they lead a personal union with Lithuania. Lithuania is effectively just part of Poland right now. And in fact, if that relationship continues for um, several years, that will actually be true as Poland can form this sort of commonwealth thing with Lithuania. So Poland is one of the more powerful nations in the game uh, because almost they're, they're almost guaranteed to get Lithuania as a dependent quite early on. As a player, uh, that's pretty much a, a full guarantee. The AI sometimes takes an alternate decision here where they don't go and take the throne of Lithuania. The AI will do that. Even if the decision one decision is clearly better, to make the game more interesting and varied, uh, the AI, when those decisions come up, they're literally programmed at, with a certain percentage. 90% I will, of the time I'll take this decision, but 10% I'm going to take this one. Not because it's better, just because it'll lead to more variation and make things a little bit more interesting. Same thing happens with the Iberian Peninsula, where Castile and Aragon can get married together. Um, the AI will sometimes not take it. It's literally a 90-10 split. I don't know about the Polish thing, but I know with the Iberian wedding, it is a 90-10 split uh, as to whether they take it or not. And it just, it's just there to shake things up and make things more interesting. Okay, pause, 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 pause. Oh, okay. Aragon has declared war on Navarra, citing subjugation. They have a CB to go and vassalize Navarra. We are allied to Navarra. I'm going to bring the speed down to two. We are allied to Navarra. My god, this 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 uh, little tutorial is not going to go any way the way I thought. We're allied to Navarra, so they're calling us in. So, right now, oh my god, they're in three separate wars? Which is fine, because it's not going to be us fighting here. They're in three separate wars, but we're only getting called into one of these, because these other two, uh, Navarra is one of the, the lesser participants in the war, so that's, that's going to be a non-issue. But Aragon has gone and declared war on them. And it looks like Naples and Savoy have indeed joined in the war. But Portugal has not. And that is true. Technically, they're fighting Portugal in another war. If I were to accept... If I were to accept, I would be fighting Aragon, Naples, and um, and Savoy. We know that for sure. We don't know if Portugal will accept the, the offensive call or not. They may or may not. And unfortunately, my allies wouldn't be called in because this is Navarra that's being called in. They're only allied with me as well. I'm their only ally. So it would be me against all those things. Wow. This is a new player tutorial, and as such, I'm going to give you... I think we could actually win. Because we do outnumber the Aragonese uh, army considerably. We probably could just go and smash them quite early, assuming we don't attack poor, cat poor territory. Unfortunately, if they go and park themselves in Navarra, that's going to be annoying, because that is mountains. But we could just go and start sieging their stuff. Um, what's equally annoying here is that we wouldn't be the war leader. And therefore, I don't think we'd be able to negotiate peace the way we want. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I, I think we probably could win, and maybe uh, the, the right, you know, most, like, win the game harder way will be to go and accept this war and join in. But it is perfectly fine for you to decline one of these called arms. We will lose 25 prestige, which does hurt, I'm not going to lie. But this does not look like a good war for us. And if a war does not look very good, don't take it. We are not going to get any of our allies in here. We're going to be fighting Aragon and all their allies. Navarro is going to be on our side, but who cares? And I, I don't like this. I don't like these odds. So I'm going to decline. This will break the alliance that we had with Navarro. We no longer have an alliance with them. We still have a royal marriage, but no alliance. Still, I don't think Navarro is going to exist for very long. They're in three separate wars against pretty powerful people. In fact, they're probably just going to lose to England. England might just piece them out for, you know, some money or something rather than conquer them. But Aragon is going to conquer them. 
All right, let's unpause. That's fine. Because we have to remember, it's 47 now. In uh, February, we go to war against Granada. In fact, why don't we go and start moving our troops to the Granada in front? Get them in position, ready to go. Hmm. So what's our relationships right now? Three of four. The Royal Marriage of Navarre, and that's it. I still would like to ally France, but not while they're in the middle of this war. That seems really unhealthy for us. I don't really like our diplomatic situation in this game. But we'll take what we can get. So what's going to happen is right around November, I'm going to increase the, the maintenance of our troops. I'm going to get them their freshly pressed uniforms, sharpening all their swords, that sort of thing. It takes a couple months, uh, well, depending on, on things. It takes X amount of time for your troops to get back to full morale. I'm going to make sure they've got at least two months um, to get back at least the vast majority of their morale before we can declare war. Our truce ends in February. I believe it should end February 1st um, in this particular scenario. So we want to be ready for that. So we get a morale tick. We would get a morale tick on February 1st, another one on January 1st. So I guess as long as we increase maintenance in December, we'd be okay. But I think November might be a little bit safer. So I'm going to do that. I'm trying to try to avoid spending too much money. So we do have a big pool for the war, just in case. Cardinal Ministers. So we got another event going on here. We've, it's about our Cardinal in Castile. So we could take option number one makes our stability cost modifier. So th this is going to last 20 years, right? Until October of 67. So option one makes our stability increases cheaper, which we don't really care about. We're a plus two right now. So we d we're not going to be increasing our stability anyway. Uh, but it is nice overall. More missionary strength is really good. Now, right now, every province in our country is Catholic. So we don't need missionaries. You don't send missionaries out remotely. Missionaries are used to convert provinces in your own nation. So we don't need it right now. But as soon as we conquer Granada, which will happen, I guarantee you, we will have to convert all the Muslim provinces to Catholicism. So we will want more missionary strength. This also gives us more tolerance of the true faith. Tolerance, if we take a look right over here. We haven't talked about unrest yet, but that is going to come. In our, on our religious panel over here, which shows that we're Catholic, for example, there are three tolerances. Tolerance of the true faith, which is, in this case, Catholic. It's our religion. Tolerance of heretics, which currently includes Orthodox and Coptic, and later on will include Protestant and Reformed. And then finally, tolerance of heathens, which is not Christian at all. So that includes Muslim, but it includes all of the pagan beliefs as well. Uh, and Hindu and Buddhist and all these guys, right? So uh, basically this comes down to Catholic, Christian, but not Catholic, and then finally, not Christian at all. And so in provinces where they have the true faith, we have, let's say this is five, we'll have a five point reduction in unrest. Whereas in these two provinces, we will actually have a two point increase in unrest. It's the way to read this, right? Tolerance is something that brings down unrest. So for example, if I were to click on Seville, right over here, and I look at my unrest over here, it says zero, but it's actually even better than that. If you mouse over, you can see our unrest is actually negative 8.8. And a big part of that reason, so part of it is because we have good legitimacy, part of it is because we have positive stability, and part of it is because they are Catholic and we have a high tolerance of Catholics. This, remember, right now we're sitting at negative 8.8. When we go and take one of these provinces from Granada, we'll see exactly how high unrest will go and how that contributes to rebellion. So. This guy here will increase the tolerance of the true faith, which doesn't really bother us too much. Lower tolerance of heretics. Well, there are no heretics yet. The Protestant doesn't exist yet, but we get more papal influence. Also very good. The other option is we could just gain 10 prestige. I like prestige, but I think option number one is great. Plus, it'll give us 20 years of increased papal influence, which I like. So papal influence, you can click down here on the papacy and see how many points that we've got right now. You can spend points to increase your chance of gaining influence over cardinals in the future. So right now, France is the only one who's invested any points. So they have a 100% chance of being the next Curia, Curia controller. So it's not more cardinals. It's gaining control over, basically, basically gaining control over the Pope, in a sense. Um, you're going to get one of your cardinals to be on, on the Pope seat, which gives your country the ability to call for crusades and also excommunicate people. Very powerful. Um, and so we might want to compete for that. But the other thing is, if we save up a lot of papal influence, we could also go and get some more things, like more diplomatic reputation, more, uh, less um, interest on our loans. This would give us more legitimacy. This would give us more national tax rate. So 20 years of 15% more tax rate. That's a lot. And so on and so forth. There's a lot of options. I'm a big fan of this one here. Um, it's very expensive at 100 papal influence. It takes a lot of points. But it's one of the few ways you can choose to increase mercantilism, which gives you a bonus to basically everything related to trade. Very potent little thing. 
Um, so right now we don't have enough points to really be worthwhile. I could spend it. Here, I'll hit the button. There we go. So we have invested some points into potentially becoming the next career controller. We've got 50-50 along with France because we've invested the same number of points. Fair enough. Anyway, we're going to keep the troops there. Uh, it is now, it is now November. So I'm going to go and raise the maintenance on the troops. That means December 1st, January 1st, and February the 1st, I will get uh, sort of morale reinforcements on the troops. So the hope is, by the time we start the war, February 1st, uh, we will have full morale and be ready to stomp this stack. They're very small. It should be pretty easy. So let's go ahead to our economy screen, and we're going to boost our army maintenance up. Obviously, we're going to make a lot less money, but we have a lot in the bank. Uh, the, the cost will go up even more when the war actually starts. So it is really important to have a bit of an nest egg. Also, notice our manpower is mostly recovered from us building. I think we dropped down to, what, 19,000, I guess, uh, manpower when we built all the regiments, and now it's coming back up to the, the cap. Once we start fighting, we will use more manpower as well because we'll have to reinforce the army as they take losses. So we're just going to let time go by. Take a look over here. Navarra. Oh! Uh, yeah, Navarra lost the war. I mean, they lost like all the wars, basically. Navarra is now a vassal under Aragon, effectively part of Aragon itself. So it sucks for us, but we'll see if we might be able to liberate them later on. We're still going to have to bring the uh, the pain towards Aragon. How's the French wars? France is in three separate wars. Awesome. Good for them. They're they're boned. Uh, we are now at plus 200 relations with uh, Portugal. I might as well leave my diplomat over there continuing to improve relations. It doesn't really hurt too much. And uh, we don't need to improve relations with Navarra as much anymore. They don't like us very much. Why? Well, we did dishonor the alliance and we refused to join their war. Now, that will go away. You can see that that penalty goes away by 4.5 per year. But they're still a little bit upset at this time. I'm going to leave my diplomat there. Well, actually, no. We don't need him. I'm going to bring him home. I'll suck up to the Pope a little bit more. But I like to have one idle diplomat, especially if I'm considering war. You need a diplomat to declare war. Someone's going to, like, write the insult in the piece of paper. Oh, my God, that's the thing I haven't covered. <laughs> I knew I was getting distracted. Your rivals. We haven't really talked about something very important called power projection. Um, which, actually, we got a huge penalty to because we dishonored the call to arms against Aragon. So I said, rivals are people that you have said, I am going to go and fight them. And that is where some of my global impressiveness is going to come from. Well... We have rivaled three countries. We had the opportunity to go to war against one of our rivals, and we turned it down. That gives us a huge penalty to power projection. Power projection is just generally good. The more power projection you have, the more bonuses that you get to a variety of different things. As soon as you got any positive power projection, you can't go negative, luckily. As soon as you got any positive power projection, you get a variety of bonuses. And there are certain breakpoints. If you get up to 25 or higher, you can have another like general or admiral without upkeep, which is nice. And if you get to 50 or more, you get plus one of all three power points. There's different ways to get power projection. Typically, it's by, you know, actually fighting wars and winning against rivals. And here, we, we did sort of check it out here. Um, but the other thing we can do, and I should have done ages ago, especially with Aragon, is you can embargo them. So embargoing them reduces their trade power in a node. I'm going to issue this. And then, I don't remember if it updates right away. Aragon's got a little bit of trade power over here. There we go. So you can see, Aragon used to have, I guess, plus 3%. Uh, extra trade power here in this node. But because I'm embargoing them, they've got a 21% penalty to that, giving us a total of negative 18. So they have less power projection here because I am embargoing them. I'm not letting their merchants work here very well. Very powerful tool. If you embargo someone who's not your rival, for example, if I were to embargo Portugal, I would also lose um, uh, percentage trade power here. So that's not a good idea. But embargoing everyone you hate is great. So every three days here, I'm going to go ahead and embargo the rest. Now, the others, England here, for example, um, and who's the third one? Oh, and Burgundy. Neither England nor Burgundy are doing any real trade in Seville. So embargoing them doesn't really help, um, it doesn't really hurt them. But what it does do is it does build a little bit of power projection. Of course, we are still at zero because we have that huge negative from not um, declaring war or not answering the call to arms. But... That will eventually show up as a thing. You can also get a few points if you just send someone an insult. Dear Aragon. Oh, I can't because I just sent you someone. Hold on. Oh, oh, it's February 1st. Truce expired. Oh, and I can send something to Aragon. Um, dear Aragon. Oh, and we're not at full morale. Interesting. You smell like poo. Send an insult. That would give us an extra five power projection. Fades off um, after five years. So those are ways you can boost your power projection. Here we're still negative, but there you go. We're going to have to wait two days for our diplomat to come home. 
and there we go. He is home. It's the 3rd of February. We have no truce going on with Granada. So we're going to right click on Granada. We're going to go to declare war and we're going to declare war. It's worth noting the Papal States, neither Papal States nor Portugal will join in. Uh, Papal States consider us to be this to be too far away and not interested to join in. Whereas Portugal um, currently still has a truce with Granada for another year. So it's going to be us alone against Granada and their ally of Tunis. We can absolutely take these guys. Um, we're going to want to do something with our fleet. So there's a few things. You know what? Let's go ahead and declare war. That's fine. We have to choose what our specific war goal is going to be. Now, we have claims on all this territory, but one specific war goal has to be announced. In this case, it's going to be a province we're looking to take. Um, the specific province that you take as part of the war goal will generate less aggressive expansion. As a result, it's going to be best if we pick the province with the highest development, which I believe will be Garnata over here. And it is. It has a 15 and the other two have six. So the more expensive the province, the more aggressive expansion, the more uh, war score cost it takes, and potentially the more diplomacy points it takes to add to the peace deal. So by declaring Garnada to be the specific war goal, we will get um, maximum, or we'll save the most amount of points. So we're going to do that. We're going to declare war. It's worth noting, there's a checkbox here to turn someone into a co-belligerent. Don't check that. Um, unless you really, really know what you're doing. Because what it would mean, if Tunis has any other allies, and they do, Tunis is also allied to the Ottomans and to Jared, which I think is right here. So Jared and the Ottomans. If we list Tunis as a co-belligerent by hitting this box, they will be able to call in their allies as well. And Jared doesn't really bother me too much. The Ottomans, that's pretty scary. So we're not going to check that. So Tunis will not be able to call additional allies. Taking anything from them will cost twice as much, but it means that we fight fewer people at the same time. So that's fine. We're going to declare war like this without Tunis checked. Declared war. Boom. And if we check the diplomatic map mode, we see Granada has turned red. Tunis hasn't turned yet. They'll take a day to make a decision. I expect that they will come into the, um, to the, the battle. Now, one thing I didn't do is actually sort of optimize things with my fleet over here. My my fleet of 12 lights is still protecting trade wandering around. We're going to want to take over manual control over here, which means it's not going to be protecting trade and therefore is not going to be, we're going to lose a little bit of money, but we'll be able to consider certain warfare aspects. So it's already locked on the Barbary coast. When any unit is halfway to its destination, you'll get this little lock icon. You can't change its mind. It's grayed out, but I will go and just try to encourage it to come to uh, the Straits of Gibraltar after it finishes going to the Gibraltar coast and hopefully, or the Barbary coast and hopefully it'll be okay. I'm going to leave the transports docked for now. They can participate in battles. They don't have that many hit points, or that many cannons, but they can help out and we may do that. Meanwhile, we want to go attack the army that's sitting in Garnada. So what I could do is grab both my armies and right click into there. A couple of things we're going to want to do first. First of all, neither one of my armies has a leader. You see where it says no leader? We haven't assigned a general to this. Now you can fight perfectly fine without a general. Well, for different values of perfectly fine. You don't get a penalty for going in without a general. That's as far as I know. God, I hope I'm not lying. But a general just adds bonuses. As Castile, I almost said Spain, as Castile, we start with the general, Alvaro de Luna over here. And he's pretty good. What do these dots mean? More dots, more better. The first two categories here basically give you, make this guy do more damage in combat. This is again the fire phase and the shock phase. They alternate back and forth um, every other round. So both of them do come into play, although shock is considerably more important at this phase in the game. How do you can tell that? Well, if you go to your, your technology screen over here, okay, this is our technology screen, we can look at our current units. Our current units are the Medieval Infantry and the Latin Knights. And here is the current um, Infantry Fire Rating and Infantry Shock Rating. Notice that Infantry Shock and Fire, or fi I should say Fire and Shock, are relatively balanced, although again, the Shock is higher. And with our Knights, Knights have zero Fire and plus one Shock. So right now, Shock is much higher. And this is not, um, this is not extra points they're not the same as pips basically well it'll it'll make sense when we come into battle let's assign this one general it's fine the other army doesn't need a general we're gonna get them to both come in over here so we're gonna fight with 29,000 troops against 8,000 troops huge numbers advantage we are gonna be attacking in the mountains which is gonna lead to a penalty let's go ahead and have people join in oh okay I was expecting that our navy is in combat here in the Gulf of Almeria we have met that's the Tunisian fleet the Tunisians joined the war and I knew they had a fleet here. This Tunisian fleet 
has shown or is here. They were just protecting Trig. It's five lights versus my 12 lights. We should be able to win. I'm going to go and move my transports in there. If we lose a few cogs, it's hardly the end of the world. The cogs do have um, some cannons. Not much, but they have something. So we're going to throw them in. We could, before we throw the, the cogs in there, we could assign an admiral. These don't have a leader. Now, we didn't start with an admiral. We could make an admiral. It costs 50 diplomatic power to make an admiral. It costs 50 military power to make a general. The problem is this. We already have one leader, and we have a limit of one leader. If we go and hire another leader, we will lose one military power per month for every leader we're above our cap. So it costs us quite a bit. So I'm going to hold off on the admiral for now. I'm just going to have the cogs go in and join the combat because they will help. We'll unpause. General's back from Granada, or uh, diplomat's back from Granada. And we're going to get these guys to jump in. I'm going to wait for the second stack to arrive, maybe. There we go. All right, those numbers that are popping up, that's how many casualties each side is taking. So the way battle works is every round, it's either going to be a shock or a fire round. Right now, we are in a shock round, for example. Um, and both sides attack each other, okay? If you ever look up the uh, EU4 wiki, um, or you see things in the game that tell you you have a bonus to attack or a bonus to defense or things like that, we are, we are the attackers in this battle. We have attacked into Garnata. But... In each round of combat, each side takes turns attacking and defending. This is quite noticeable um, if you start looking at some of these units down here. So we've got all these various pips I was talking about, right? But you look here, you see the reformed Gallo Glay infantry? So they still don't have any pips in fire. They do have pips in shock. But you see how there's the yellow pips on top and the green pips on the bottom? The yellow pips are used to attack and the greens are used to defend. But it's important to remember, no matter if you are the, the true attacker or the true defender in combat, you use both stats. You're constantly attacking and constantly defending in combat, so both pips matter, okay? Um, so how does combat work? Every round, both sides roll a die. I rolled a six, which is amazing, and they rolled a one, which is poor. It goes, it's zero to nine is the die roll you can end up with. So they rolled very poorly and I rolled relatively well. In addition to that, depending on the phase, you add the pips from your, your character. So they have zero shock. I have two shock. Two minus zero is two, which is why we have a two over here. Okay, so it's a difference. If they had one pip of shock, then this would have just added one to my die roll. If they had a shock of four, then they would be getting plus two while I would be getting no bonus whatsoever. So it's the difference in shock, because it's the shock phase right now, gets added to the die roll. So now it's like we rolled an eight, but we are attacking into the mountains. Mountain gives you a minus two on all your rolls. So we're back down to a six. It's a six versus one. We got a better roll, which is good. As a result of that, we, um, you take your, your difference in your rolls, effectively, there, there's the complicated math, but what you can sort of imagine is you take your difference in your total rolls and then add your, your, in this case, your shock from all your units together and you multiply it by a magic and you end up with a total number of casualties. And so if I pause again, I'm going to go at speed one. Every day there'll be another little boom. There you go. See, they just lost almost 600 people. We still lost 232, even though we are outnumbering them more than four to one, and they have no morale, and they are rolling quite poorly compared to me. This is the same the same roll here. Both sides lose casualties, including my side, because they are attacking back at the same time. Now. Every time you do this, and it calculates a certain number of casualties, those casualties then get effectively multiplied by your base morale, or sorry. So if I inflict, say, a thousand casualties on their side, that thousand casualties will be basically multiplied by my base morale, and that will be used to inflict morale damage on them. The higher your base morale is, and the more casualties you inflict, the more morale the other side loses. So by having more morale, a, you have more morale hit points, but B, you actually deal more morale damage. The other two stats here are much simpler to explain. Discipline makes you kill more people. Tactics means you lose fewer people. As a result, tactics or discipline leads to more casualties, which leads to more morale damage. So discipline, very, very powerful. Um, and tactics means you lose less people, which means you take less morale damage. So again, tactics are very powerful. Also, uh, high discipline actually increases your tactics as well, which is pretty potent. So all these stats are very important in combat, as well as just pure numbers and other leadership things. Bigger numbers tend to work better, but now I hope you have a little bit of understanding of like how you might be able to use the numbers a bit better. Attacking to the mountains like this, very bad. You almost never want to attack in mountains, except we had such a massive numerical advantage that it was okay. But if this was even numbers, we would have lost. It's worth noting the naval battles work exactly the same. I wasn't looking at the um, 
the combat results there. Um, but the naval battles effectively work the same, plus there's sort of like a maneuver thing that happens. We have defeated the, um, the Tunisian Navy. We actually sank one, and only one of their ships, and the rest went away. Actually, we didn't sink it, we captured it. We have an extra light ship. Congratulations, folks. And we didn't lose anything at all. Fantastic. So we earned a little bit of war score doing that. We're going to revisit that in a moment. Um, I'm going to tell this fleet to just come back over here. So my fleet is still going to go to the Barbary Coast first, and then it's going to pop back here, and I'll get it to combine up with our transport ships. We're going to watch the end of this battle. It should be almost over. They're about out of morale, and indeed they are. Okay. So I keep saying, keep lying to you, um, when an army runs out of morale, it retreats. That's certainly what happened to the Tunisian fleet. The Tunisian fleet had lost, or one ship had been captured, and then it, it went away. At least I think so. Uh, yeah, it did. Um, when an army runs out of morale, it retreats. It retreats to friendly territory. However, there's a period of time before you can retreat. And I didn't show it on the battle screen, but there's like a little sort of flag in the top left corner of the battle screen. Until that goes away, you are not allowed to retreat. Because the army we were attacking ran out of morale before that flag went away, they never got any opportunity, so we killed slash captured all of them. This also earned us 6.66 war score. What is war score? So you'll notice at the bottom of the screen here, now that we're in a war, there's this little icon at the bottom. It's got the flag of, Gar of um, Granada in here, because that's our opponent in the war. And it's got a little 6% under it. Let's click on this. It'll open the war screen. This giving us details about the war. Who is on each side? We are on the left side here, Castile. We've got no allies, so we're alone. On the right side, Granada. It's got the star, because they are actually the war leader. They can negotiate for the whole alliance. And then there's Tunis here, which is a secondary combatant in here. And they're not a co-belligerent, so we can't ask for as much stuff. We've got some other stats, including their current war enthusiasm, their war exhaustion, and a few other things like that. That can give you a bit of a breakdown about how things are going. Then we've got this thing. This is the war score. War score goes from minus 100% to plus 100%. And it's technically mirrored on the other side. So if the other side were looking at this, they'd be seeing this as a minus 6%. Because we are winning the war, and they are losing the war. Winning battles earns you war score. Um, blockading bits. We are blockading. We have a small fleet that is blockading the port of Maria, which is earning us a little bit of... Um, of war score. In addition to that, when we finally siege territory, which we're going to look at in a bit, we can earn a lot of war score from sieging territory. Um, sieging forts gives you a lot more war score. Sieging places without forts are worth very little, but they do siege instantly, which is the big difference. Um, and sieging the capital in particular is very, 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 very powerful. Finally, there's also the war goal. The war goal is to take Garnada. Right now, um, this is worth no war score. Like, there's bonus war score for the war goal. So if I were to siege out any random province, I would get war score. And that's still going to be the truth for Garnada. But once we actually conquer, once we actually finish the siege of Garnada and occupy it, in addition to the war score of Garnada itself, we will get a ticking war score. It ticks a little bit every month, and it caps out at plus 25. So in addition to the actual value of sieging Garnada in general, because it's the war goal, we will get even more war score as a result of that. So we got our army here. It's currently sitting in Garnada, and it just finished the battle. We actually have to wait one day before we can do anything. We actually, like, can't do anything with it. It doesn't respond to any commands whatsoever. We just have to wait one day. There we go. It's the 19th. So now we have a big stack of troops sitting in Garnada. I'm going to go and group these two together. Let's take a look at our numbers. We still have 19 regiments of infantry, but only 17,812 people. And we still have 10 regiments of cavalry, but only 900... And 9,602 cavalry. So a lot of our regiments, we can see here, are no longer at full strength. They don't have a thousand people in them anymore. Some do. They, they probably didn't even get in the fight. And others who were at the front line took some damage. So what we can do is we can leave them as is. They will um, reinforce. Right now we can see we'll we need 1,500 men to fully reinforce. And 600 will reach the army this month. So it'll take us a little, a little over three months to reinforce. And the reinforce happens at the end of the month slash start of the month, uh, depending on your point of view. And therefore, in practice, it'll take four months before we get fully reinforced. Um, there is something else we can do. If we were to fight right now, if we were immediately going to be jumping into the fight, we would not want to fight with regiments that aren't full strength because they won't deal as much damage and therefore we will perform less well. There's a button here to consolidate regiments. If we do this, and I'm going to do it right now as an example, what it's going to do, it's going to reorganize the people to make as many full strength regiments as possible. So we went from 19 regiments to 18. Basically what it did is it eliminated one regiment and then the people from there, it redistributed amongst all the other regiments um, to bring them up to a thousand. And we didn't have quite enough to fill them all out. 
But we, so we have the same total number of infantry here. They're just organized differently so that we have more of a solid front line, which is great. Now that we've done that, let's talk about attrition. We are above the supply limit of this province. This province has a supply limit of 18, which is a little bit lower than uh, some of the other ones because it's a mountain. Mountains don't have as much supply limit. And currently we have a, a unit weight of 25.4. How do we have a unit weight of 25 when we have a little over 27,000 troops here? The reason is generals with maneuver, in addition to doing a variety of things, actually lower the, the effective um, unit weight of an army to make it, um, to make it use up less supply. So that's what's happening here. That being said, we're still gonna lose 4.1% of our army every single month. That's a lot of troops here. Um, I'm not gonna math it. Is it like a thousand people? Hang on. 27,000 um, times 4.1 divided by 100. Yeah, 1,100 people, cheapers. So over a thousand people are gonna die every month standing in this territory. I mean, it's foreign territory, there's, you know, we can't get enough food, maybe there's some people ambushing us and sabotaging us and killing some people. So we don't want to stay here. Now, no matter what, there's always going to be attrition in this province because it's enemy territory. But it doesn't mean we have to stay in here with this many people and have this many people suffer attrition. So how many people do we have to keep here to siege this fort? Because we do. There's a fortress here. We have to surround this fortress and starve them out of food. That's how you win a siege. You can... If you happen to be able to breach the walls, you can assault the fortress, but that tends to be a really bad idea that gets you a lot of people killed. Mostly you just have to surround the fort and wait for everyone to starve and surrender. So it's gonna take a while. And if we click on the province, so now if we click on the province, instead of the normal province view, which you can see again by hitting show province, if you hit the province, you get the siege view. If you are on the province view, there's a button here to show the siege view here. So you can alternate between the two. This shows the siege stats, and we're going to be looking at these in a moment. But the important one here is how many regiments we need to siege this. Nine. And that's nine fully strength ones. Technically, it, it almost like instead of saying regiments needed, it should say troops needed, 9,000. So we're going to need at least 9,000 people here to siege this. If we have fewer than 9,000, we won't make siege progress. So what I could do is I could just go and leave. There we go. Leave 9,000 people behind. That's perfectly fine. All right? A little bit tedious, maybe but it's a perfectly fine thing to do. The other way you can do it, if you have your one army, there's a button right here, detach enough units to execute a siege properly. Oh, that's cool. So if I hit that button, it's gonna do what I just did. It's just gonna drop off 9,000 troops, and actually it did slightly more than that because of the way this regiment is, um, behind to siege that. That's cool. That's fine, that's very convenient. Notice that the army it left us with, because it prioritizes leaving infantry, the army it left us with is too high on cavalry. We're actually going to take a penalty in combat, but we're not planning any more combat. So that's good. So let's take our current army. Let's move it directly back into our territory to try to minimize the attrition. Hopefully we'll get out of the way before the end of February here, which will mean we won't get a attrition tick. When are we going to get there? 25th of February. Yeah, so we're going to be fine. And there. So we are still getting attrition here because we're in enemy territory, but we're only getting the 1% attrition which is the minimum number. So that's great. We're not gonna get any more than we need, and we have the minimum number of troops here required. We could have made it exactly 9,000, but I actually like leaving a little bit extra because if you get an attrition tick that causes you to lose a few people and they don't reinforce in time, then what can happen is um, the siege will stop for a month until your reinforcements get sorted out properly. Now, there are two more provinces here we would like to siege. So let's go and detach some troops to do that. There's a button to split the army in half. You could do that, but these don't have forts. You only need a thousand people to siege out a place without a fort. So I'm going to make one infantry, go down there, and go, go this way. I'm just holding shift to queue it up. It's going to take a little bit longer, but then it's not going to add extra attrition. And you can go over there. Great. Okay. We've talked about blockade. You can see this uh, navy here. I'm going to combine them one. It says 100%. We have enough ships here to get 100% blockade of all enemy ports on the sea, of which there's only one. So we are getting a little bit of war score because of that. So A, blockading is clearly good because of war score, but it goes beyond that. If we look at the siege, how does the siege work? Well, there's a little bar, a little green bar here that slowly fills up over time. It's also this bar over here. And right now, every 37 days, that bar will reach its cap and we will roll the dice to see if we have successfully executed the siege. And right now, there is a negative 70% chance that we will successfully siege this place out. Why, why is that so bad? Well, it's because to, su complete, or to successfully complete the siege, 
you have to get you have to roll a 20. If you roll a 20 or more on your siege roll, they will surrender and you will win the siege. The problem is you can only the siege roll is a 1 to 14 die. That's it. The most you can roll on dice is 14. So you can't possibly get to 20. You need to build up modifiers. As you wait here and as you siege, you will do things that will help to advance the siege. Um, so first of all, we will roll every every 37 days, we will roll a die that'll come out to 1 to 14. And I believe that will show up here. I'm pretty sure, yeah, yeah, that will be the actual die roll. So the 1 to 14 will show up here. And then there's some modifiers here. We're going to get a minus 3 to that roll because of the fort level. It's a level 3 fort, we get minus 3 to our rolls. Plus, this is a coastal province that is not being blockaded. You can imagine that people are able to bring in food and supplies through this port. As a result, that's giving us an extra minus two to our roll. So really, the best we can roll right now is a nine, and that's if we get lucky. And if we look here, we can see what a nine would be. So if we roll, um, if we roll exactly a one, we will end up with a disease outbreak. If we roll a five through nine, we will generate a supplies shortage. And we can see what that does right over here. A, I think a disease outbreak is bad for us, actually. I think that, that kills some of our people. But the, um, I can't remember. Pretty sure that's the truth. Um, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. A natural one, one, roll of one. So if we just roll a one, the attacker suffers a disease outbreak that reduced the number by 5%. And that's the sort of thing that can happen that sometimes screws up your siege progress for a bit until you get reinforcements. So that's why it's good to have some extra people. So if we roll a five to nine, and we know because of our, our minus five rolls, we on our 14-sided our die would have to roll a... Um, a 10 to 14 to end up in there, which is why there's a 35% chance that we'll get the supplies shortage. But if we get that, then we're going to get a modifier over here that gives us plus one to our future rolls. And this can keep stacking up. If we get supply shortage over and over and over, I believe it will keep stacking up. There's a cap. This, the whole thing here can only add up to a 12 in total. Okay. But it can get there. And then the things later on that currently we can't get, but with a few pluses we can get a chance to develop. Then we're going to get food shortages, water shortages, all these things will start to help out with the siege and, and progress it further until we've got enough plus modifiers on our side. But can we get rid of that minus two? Absolutely. If I take my fleet and I blockade the Straits of Gibraltar, and I'm going to do that, I'm going to move my whole fleet over to the Straits of Gibraltar, and once it arrives, we'll be blockading that. So I'm lifting the blockade of uh, Maria over here because I don't particularly care about it. I think it, it doesn't matter. It's actually, we're going to siege it in a second. It doesn't have a fort, so we're going to instantly siege this thing more or less, so then we don't need to blockade it. But by going over here, now we have 100% blockade of, actually, technically both Garnata and, well, this is going to be Gibraltar. It's what, Jabal Tariq over here. We're blockading both, uh, both ports. If there are a lot of ports and a lot of development, you'd need a lot of ships to get the job done, although this fleet of 23 is pretty darn potent. Notice some of our ships are damaged, and they do not repair at sea by default, so keep that in mind. Now that we're blockading Garnata over here, we have eliminated that minus two penalty. Notice our percentage chance. It's still negative. It still can't happen, but it's not as bad as it used to be. And now we have a 50% chance instead of what it was, a 36% chance to get a supply shortage on our opponent. So let's go ahead and go to speed four for a bit. Okay, maybe speed three. Four was a bit fast. And we're just going to wait for that to fill out. There we go. There we go. So we got a siege tick. I actually missed the little pop-up. Did we get a food shortage? Was that possible? Yeah, I, I totally missed the pop-up. You guys can rewind and check to see what that was. But we now have a plus two to this roll. So presumably got that. Well, it must have been. Can more than one thing happen? I don't think so. But now, oh, we actually, oh, we rolled a natural 14. So we got a wall breach as well. Oh, fantastic. So every time you roll a 14, um, pretty sure that's true. Does it say in here? It doesn't say it here. I might be lying to you guys. I, I don't think so. Breaching the walls gives a plus three bonus to siege roll. Anyway, so now that it's breached, we could go and assault, but we're not going to do that. We're getting big bonuses, which is great. These walls should start to melt away. The more bonuses you have, the easier it is to get the things that improve your progress. There we go. And I told you that these sieges would happen fast. And the reason is we have a 100% chance to successfully siege this because there's no forts. We do have to wait, wait for one round of uh, siege ticks, which again is 37 days right now. Boom. But it still happened. We went ahead and sieged all those. And I'm going to go ahead and just retreat my troops back here and keep them attrition free, but combined. So now we just have to be patient and wait for Garnada. Now, of course, there's still Tunis over here. 
and we will probably have to deal with them soon enough, but overall I'm feeling okay. Um, there's a random uh, Granada and ship over here. I would like to go and try to smash it. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to hit the button that says Detach Blockade. It's going to detach all the ships needed to keep 100% blockade over here. And I'm going to see if I can engage over there. The uh, cross swords indicates that there will be a combat if I go there. So they shouldn't be able to escape. There we go. 14 versus 1. We easily sink it, get a little bit more war score. And I'm going to return my ships over to the Straits of Gibraltar. Ah! They're actually going to go in and attack me here. Well, I'm going to have to take it because these guys are locked in. It'd be nice to have an um, admiral at this point. I suppose what it could do... I'm going to go and dock my, my cogs momentarily. Oh. Okay, they did dock. Great. Because what's happening is we're being attacked by the four Granadan ships, but we're also getting the fleet of... Um, so 17 Tunisian ones. Mostly it's... It's galleys. I'm happy I'm not fighting in the Gulf of Almeria, because this would be inland sea, so they'd get a huge bonus, those galleys. But this is going to be out in the sea, so they're not going to get much of a bonus. On my uh, navy that's docked, I'm going to assign an admiral. You can only assign an admiral when you are docked at a friendly port. So I'm going to spend the 50 diplomatic power to hire an admiral. <sighs> He's not great. And notice we've got a pop-up to say we have too many military leaders, but I want to make sure we win this battle. So I'm going to assign Fernando here and get him to come out and join this fight. So now... We have more ships now. Most of the ships we added in here were transport ships, not very powerful at combat. But we do have an actual admiral helping out. They have one too. They have one with two shock. We only have one with one shock. But at least it's going to counter some of their stuff. I'm not worried about this four stack of ships. It's now I'm worried. Now I'm worried. They have more ships than we do. Although, 13 of them are transports, which we know don't fight that well. Sure, 10 of mine are transports, but I do have 13 uh, light ships, which are going to be about as good as the galleys. I think we can win this, although some of my ships were already damaged, so that's a little scary. They also have a higher base morale. We'll have to keep an eye on them. We did get an event as well, poor uniforms. Random event over here is going to give us two years of a 5% penalty to our morale. It sucks, but uh, I think it's only ground troops, and my ground troops aren't going to fight for a bit. Now, we're going to try to monitor this. If we start to lose a bunch of ships, I will go and dock. Uh, looks like we might lose one of our barks here. Oh, and they had their light ships join in. Okay, no. So they have a much more powerful fleet now. Seven light ships, the eight galleys. I don't think the seven were there before. Maybe I missed it. So we there's no little flag here. We are allowed to retreat. And I could wait until I run out of morale, but I know I'm going to lose ships along the way, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to force my troops to retreat. We're going to intentionally lose the battle, so we lost war score, but it means we're not going to lose any more ships. So we're going to keep them parked here, and we're certainly going to let them repair as much as possible. Downside to this is we are no longer blockading so the Siege of Garnada is going to take longer. Meanwhile, we're being blockaded, so we're going to lose um, a little bit of war score from that blockade. But maybe when our ships get fully repaired, we'll pop back out again. It depends on if the Tunisian fleet moves or not. So we'll play that one by ear. But for now, that's that. Now, if we still had those three heavies, we probably could have won that easily. But those three heavies are very expensive, and I'm not, I'm not regretting getting rid of them. We should be able to have a mostly naval superiority uh, going forward here. And if nothing else... What is Tunis going to do? Drop like three guys at a time? Well, I guess they had like ten transports. Drop ten guys at a time into my territory? Well, I should be able to kill them because I will have a, a massive superior number of ground troops available to counter any naval invasion. So meanwhile, we're going to take the capital of Granada in a moment. That's going to be worth a lot of war score. Hey, we're at plus 14 now already. Wonderful. We're almost capped on all our potential bonuses to uh, the siege status here. So we're, we're developing very well. I'm really happy about that. Um, right, and... So it'd be nice if we could go and land in Tunis and maybe, you know, mess some stuff over there. Maybe even take some of their territory. I don't know. But if we can't, it's fine. Because we will have the war goal. Remember, as soon... So right now, our war goal, we are losing war score. We have negative 3.2 war score because we do not occupy the war goal. My opponent occupies the war goal. So they are, they are getting war score, whereas I am losing war score. But as soon as I capture this, A... All the war score that they've accrued from holding the war goal is going to instantly go away, and instead it's going to tick up on my side. And so we're going to get another plus 25 from that, and we're going to see exactly, first of all, this province, because it's got high development and it's their capital, this province will be worth a lot of war score by itself. And then we'll get the extra plus 25. And then we can just wait. We can just sit on our hands and, ooh, do nothing. Mm, I'm going to keep an eye on these fleets here. I don't know what I'm do with my diplomat, because he's not going to be busy for a while. I'm going to send him over to Morocco. We're going to fabricate a claim on Tangiers. I think that's going to go beyond uh, what this tutorial will end up covering. But we know Tangiers 
is in the Seville trade node. It's Tangiers and Melilla. We would love to control both of these because it would give us more trade power in this trade node. In particular, Tangiers is a coastal center of trade. It's a very valuable province and we would love to grab that. But right now we got nothing to do with wait. I'll go up to speed four. So every 37 days, right now we're at a 21% chance of successfully completing the stage, stage. It's not negative anymore. So, okay, we failed. Defenders are retreated, but it didn't give us an extra plus. We're also getting a little bit of gold over here. Every province has got a certain amount of lootability um, over here. And just by having troops in an opponent's territory, even if you're not successfully sieging it, you will go and um, loot the province a bit. Oh, I can call Portugal in my war. That's interesting. See that? Portugal would be willing to join the war at this point. Interesting. Even though they're still technically in another war, but I guess they're winning. They'd be perfectly happy to jump in. I am going to go ahead and call that in. Because... Uh, interesting. I think that might be lying to us. I'm worried if I send this, Portugal might say no, and that'll break our alliance. I'm going to wait another month, make sure that that's, like, true here. March 1st? No, the still says they're willing. Alright, I'm going to send it in. We'll see. I'm a little concerned, I've got to be honest. No, Portugal was happy to join in. Excellent. Excellent. Portugal, on our side. So now their fleet... Ah, actually, there's combat already. Um, I think I'm going to go and join in here. My fleets, my ships are almost completely repaired. I'm going to jump in and help Portugal over here. There are six lights. Uh, there's still the possibility of some Grenadan and Tunisian people joining us, but I was going to say Portugal's got more ships over here. There we go. Actually, they're going to fight. They are fighting against some galleys. So you see that plus? That implies that these galleys are getting a bonus to their combat strength. So it's a bit worrisome. But let's see what happens. Hopefully we don't lose our fleet. But I think we are winning. And there we go. The Portuguese won their battle, and their ships are going to come and reinforce over here. They've also got a godlike general. Oh, actually, the Tunisians decided to run rather than fight the um, the army. Cool. So now we can resume our blockade over here, which is going to give us more chances. Now, what I'd like to do is I would like to repair these ships. So I've got some repaired ships. i got a button here, detach damage. If I click that, it'll select only my my fully repaired ships if i just click in here it'll select the other fleet which is all my damaged ones i'm gonna send all my damaged ones to get repaired i'm gonna keep sieging this out i'm just gonna wait for the siege to finish then we will end it okay we didn't we had a 35 percent chance we didn't get it but we did advance the progress a little bit so we're at the full 12 over here we don't have a penalty on our side so this is as good as it gets and it will get there there we go 42% chance, and it went. So we completed that siege. It took 445 days to siege out Granada. So now we have control. We occupy all three of these provinces. We don't own them. They still belong to Granada, but we occupy them. The Granada can't do anything with this territory at this time. Uh, it's fully under our thumb. We don't get anything really out of it. I mean, technically, technically we're earning a bit of tax, apparently, but that's, I mean, that should effectively just be zero. Um, there is a fair amount of unrest that has built up here, though. Notice that. Because we don't, we have a religious mismatch, and because of some war exhaustion that we have all over the country, there is a little bit of unrest. And there's a chance of an uprising. It's not, it hasn't reported there, but it is. It, it will, it will show up soon. There will start to be a chance of uprising. If we look at the war screen, Granada, their war enthusiasm is low because they've lost all their stuff, plus they have a little bit of war exhaustion. Um, Tunis's war enthusiasm is still high. Now, you can negotiate with people separately. I can go, if you right-click on here, you can open up the diplomacy screen from that, which is right, really nice, or of course I could right-click. I could see if Tunis is willing to negotiate peace. And no, they're totally unwilling, even with a white piece. A white piece means no one wins or loses anything. They're unwilling. Let's take a look at um, Granada instead. So I'm going to talk to Granada, sue for peace. So right now, they would be willing to accept a white piece, where no one gets anything. The war just ends, they, they keep their territory, I keep my territory, no gold exchanges hands. Obviously, we're not going to go for that. That would be crazy. If someone declared on us and we were worried about losing the battle, we'd be quite happy with negotiating at a white piece. But in this case, no, no, we're not accepting white peace, we're going to demand something. So how do you demand stuff? We have 42% war score right now. And this roughly coincides with how much war score worth of stuff we can ask for which totals up into a peace offer value. So for example, if I asked for Maria over here, I can either click on the world map or I can click on it here. This has a war score of 11. So now my war score is 42, the peace offer is 11. 
And if you mouse over the check mark, we can see all the modifiers involved. Um, so as long as there's more positives than negatives, they will accept. So here we have positives from the war score, from occupying provinces, from the strength of alliances. We have stronger uh, allies in this war than they do. Uh, the military strength, etc. These are all things that benefit me. And on the negative side is the length of war. This has actually been a very short war so far. It's only been a little over a year. And as a result, they are reticent to peace out when the war hasn't gone on for a really long time. I don't remember exactly how long it takes for this length of war modifier to go away. I don't, I don't know if it's five years. There's certain things happen after five years. I'm not exactly sure about the length of war modifier, but you can just wait that out. If they won't accept your current peace deal, you can just wait a little bit longer. And then this current peace deal is worth minus 11, but that's easily counteracted by a war score. So they'd be willing to take this, but obviously we want more than that. What if we also ask for Granada? Yep, they'd still be willing because that comes out to 26 war score. Okay. What if I ask for Jabal Thrik? All of a sudden they say no. Why is that? This total peace offer value is only 37. We have 42% war score. Well, it's because this taking this province would result in all of Granada to be annexed. They would go away completely. They'd be completely swallowed up. And that leads to a giant negative modifier. That combined with the length of war means they're not willing to do it. So what do we do? Well, we wait at this point. Even if we don't conquer, we can get more war score by going and occupying some territory in Tunis. But even if we don't do that, we know we're going to get ticking war score right now from our war goal. We're going to get up to plus 25 more because we control the war goal of Granada. So that's 25% more war score by itself. And in addition to that, if we just wait, the length of war modifier will tick down. We have to do nothing else. We will be very comfortably taking all this territory. We could go and, and take some things in Tunis. If we occupy land in Tunis, two things. One, it generates more war score. Two, it will lower the enthusiasm of Tunis to continue. We might be able to convince Tunis to, to stand aside. Even if we don't take anything from them, we could convince them to, be, to, to get out of the war, in which case the only participant would be Granada. And at that point, 100% of their, the territory of all the enemies in this war would be occupied. We would get an instant 100% war score. Okay? Right now, to get 100%, we would have to occupy all of Tunis. But if Tunis were out of the war, we'd have 100% just by holding Granada. If we also, if we just waited five years, after five years, if you have 100% of the primary target, then you get a 100% war score at that point. But that's it. So, all we have to do is wait. We can sink some more ships. We can see if we can land in Tunis. Um, or we can just sit around here and, and literally do nothing. We will win this war. So next episode, we'll come back. We'll finish up this war one way or another. And then we will look at what post-war cleanup looks like. What I might actually do is I might just fast forward at this point between episodes. I might just fast forward until these guys are willing to accept peace. That might, that might work. Thanks for watching, folks. See you next time.